This is the History of Space Flight and Space Technology. I'm Andy Chaikin. This is Week 6, Apollo 4 through Apollo 8. By the summer of 1968, NASA was largely recovered from the uh, tragic fire that had taken the lives of the Apollo 1 crew. Um, they had completely redesigned the command module to make it fireproof and uh, a number of other improvements. And they were looking forward in the fall of that year to uh, flying the first manned test flight in Earth orbit of the command and service modules, which you see here. Um, the basic configuration, you can see the command module in blue is, of course, the, the cone-shaped spacecraft where the astronauts would ride um, during the trip out to the moon on a lunar mission and uh, the portion of the flight that took place in lunar orbit and uh, the trip home from the moon. So it was sort of the ferry craft and it was the only part of the entire Apollo spacecraft to return to Earth. It contained all the, crew, the um, controls and displays, uh, the instruments that the astronauts would use during the flight to control the spacecraft and monitor all of its systems. Um, it had the environmental control system that made sure that the cabin atmosphere was maintained at the, the proper temperature, the proper pressure, um, and moisture content. Uh, you can see uh, at the nose of the command module is a, a docking mechanism that would be used on uh, rendezvous and docking flights with a lunar module uh, to uh, attach to the, the lunar module. And then uh, that could be removed and open up a tunnel between the two spacecraft. Uh, the command module had a blunt heat shield, just like Mercury and Gemini, um, but it had to be a little bit more demanding even than Mercury and Gemini because it had to withstand reentry into the Earth's atmosphere at lunar velocities, lunar mission reentry speeds, which uh, you know basically the same as the speed required to leave the Earth is the is the speed at which you come back. Uh, 25,000 miles per hour, so quite a bit more heating uh, experienced by the command module than, than uh, Mercury or Gemini during these Earth orbit missions that we've been hearing about so far. And then, of course, uh, also in, in the nose portion of the spacecraft, the parachutes that would lower uh, the command module uh, to a safe splashdown in the ocean after the reentry was complete. One more thing you can see um, around the base of the command module and also uh, just forward of the hatch are uh, several uh, sets of maneuvering thrusters that would be used to control the command module's orientation during the re-entry. This turned out to be a very important feature for guiding the command module through the atmosphere during those high-speed re-entries. It was in fact steered uh, aerodynamically um, by controlling its orientation because of the fact that the command module had a center of gravity that was displaced from its center of figure. Um, that gave it an uneven uh, balance, if you will, as it came into the atmosphere and by adjusting the command module's orientation along its roll axis, um, you could create a, a lift vector that would go in whatever direction you desired and that would allow you to, to um, adjust the command module's flight path through the atmosphere. And uh, this was uh, done under normal circumstances by the onboard computer. Behind the command module, the big green cylinder is called the service module, and uh, it contains, uh, among other things, the fuel and oxidizer uh, supply and uh, for the big service propulsion engine, which is the, the purple colored nozzle at the back there, and uh, the, all the machinery for that rocket engine, the fuel supply and the oxidizer supply, uh, kept in the service module. Now that engine created 20,000 pounds of thrust, so that was the big engine that would be used to uh, get the astronauts into lunar orbit by slowing it down, allowing it to catch, be captured by the moon's gravity, and then uh, when it was time to come back to Earth, it would fire again to send them home. It obviously 
there was a great premium placed on the reliability of that engine because the astronauts' lives absolutely depended on that engine firing to get them out of lunar orbit. And even the maneuver to go into lunar orbit, it was critical that it fire for exactly the right amount of time with very little margin for error because if it fired too long, they could crash into the moon. And if it fired too little, they could end up in some wacky orbit that they would have to uh, try to get out of. Um, so because of that need for reliability and, and uh, for, for reliability, it was designed to be as simple as possible. It had no ignition system. In fact, it used what are called hypergolic propellants. I've left out an E in the word hypergolic. Um, in this case, nitrogen tetroxide and um, dimethyl hydrazine, which when uh, combined would ignite spontaneously. So you didn't need an injection system that removed a whole layer of complexity that other rocket engines would have. And uh, the valves that opened the, the fuel and oxidizer to the engine were very were as simple as possible to be as reliable as possible. Um, you also see the uh, fuel cells. Those are the, the s sort of smallish cylinders on the lower right quadrant of the service module. Those created electricity by combining hydrogen and oxygen, uh, which were stored uh, in cryogenic form in storage tanks in the service module. And um, you got water as a byproduct, which could be used for drinking as well as for, uh, for cooling. Um, and uh, then you have the big steerable high gain antenna for communication at lunar distance. So that is the command and service modules. Now let's take a look at the lunar module. Well, the lunar module started out looking quite different from the way it ended up. You can see different phases of the lunar module's design uh, as it was first thought about in 1962, which you'll remember is the year that the uh, Apollo uh, managers and NASA in general decided on the lunar orbit rendezvous scheme for Apollo, which re required and featured this separate lunar landing spacecraft. Notice that over the years that the LEM was in development, um, and by the way, the word LEM uh, sounds like it should be spelled L-E-M, and it was originally, it was originally called Lunar Excursion Module, and um, they changed it to Lunar Module after that. I think they felt that excursion sounded too frivolous, so it was just the L-M, but people kept calling it the LEM. Anyhow, weight was always the big concern for the LEM, and so with Grumman, the manufacturer, trying to cut ounces, even grams, off the design, what they ended up doing was they realized this This is a spacecraft that only has to fly in, in uh, zero gravity or the moon's one-sixth gravity. So you don't need seats. Well, that saved a bunch of weight. Uh, the astronauts could fly it standing up. Uh, you don't need those big windows that you see in the, um, the 1962 version. Because if you're standing up, you can have your eye right up close to a much smaller window. And it did not need to be aerodynamic because it didn't, you know, it didn't need to be streamlined because it was never going to have to fly in an atmosphere. So you can see that over the years, the shape got less rounded and more angular. And uh, they did uh, take away the front docking hatch and they realized they didn't need to have two docking hatches. They could just dock at the, the top hatch and let that be the docking hatch. And the front hatch would be an exit way for the astronauts to walk on the moon. Um, and, uh, by the way, the LEM still, the early LEMs, were still too heavy to land on the moon. It was not until Apollo 11 that they actually built a lunar module that was actually light enough to land on the moon and take off again. Well, we're about to hit our 10-minute limit, and so we'll pick this up in the next segment.